We're used to talking to developers about the games they've created, but it's not often we get to talk about how a movie was made. Immortality is an interactive film video game directed by Sam Barlow, the man behind her story and Telling Lies, which has you scrubbing through archive footage of three era-specific films in an effort to solve the mystery behind their leading lady. The game was released on PC stores, Xbox consoles via Game Pass, and even had a mobile release as part of Netflix's gaming initiative. And while the genre of this game may be niche, Immortality was well received by critics and has won awards at GDC, the IGF, and even BAFTA. In most of our documentaries, we talk to artists, animators, level designers, and gameplay programmers. So what happens when your main character isn't a 3D model, but a person? When your levels aren't designed, but built? When the characters aren't modeled, but dressed. Immortality is not your typical video game, and this isn't going to be a typical no-clip documentary. Today, we're going to sit down with people on both sides of the camera, from the cast to the crew, the director and producers. We're going to take a look at the design of all three of its movies, 60s gothic Ambrosio, 70s detective noir Minsky, and 90s thriller Two of Everything. We're going to talk about casting, acting, producing, set dressing, costumes, the cinematic inspirations behind the story, how intimate scenes are filmed, the safe use of weapons on set, the reality of working in Hollywood, and the reception the game has had upon its release. I'm just going to go right out and say this, there are some fairly big spoilers in this video, from specific plot points to the central mystery that plagues all three films. So if you want to enjoy Immortality, please hit pause, subscribe to our channel, and come back sometime later. But if you've solved the mystery of Marissa Marcel and want to know how it was all put together, we hope you enjoy this film. And speaking of Marissa, let's meet our leading lady, or rather, our leading ladies. I've been, I've been acting since I was a kid, um, and my first professional acting gig was I did Don Juan by Moliere in this regional theater festival in France, and that was great. I was like the youngest in the cast, and there were all these you know, young adults and adults sort of shepherding me into the, the theater space. And I did that when I was 15, I think. And I knew I wanted to do it for a living, but I was like, oh, there's a way to do this for a living. And what I wanted to do was go to drama school in uh, London, and that just sort of didn't work out. They weren't interested. So made it back over here and Juilliard, and that was, you know, four years of theater training. And then from there, came out here and was just auditioning. And then Immortality was the first real, you know, screen thing I got, so that's, and now I'm here. <laughs> the initial script I got was 407 pages long, <laughs> and it was the entire script of the whole thing. So I was a little confused because I got it and I was like, oh, you know, um, Marissa Marcel, but also Matilda Rosario, Franny, Heather, Maria, and maybe this other thing. What is this? And then reading about it, it you know, they sent me like the, the Bible and everything, and it was, it was this like love letter to cinema of that time period and everything. And they were calling it like an interactive, interactive media something. And then that turned into, it's a video game. I got very excited when I read the sides, the, the audition material, because I was like, this is incredible writing. Like I've never, you just don't read stuff like that when you, you don't read stuff like that period, but certainly not when you're starting out and you're a nobody. Like you don't get material like that. Maybe in the theater you do, but even then it's just very hard to get in those rooms. And so I was like, oh my God, like kind of chomping at the bit to be a part of it. And my agents were excited for me, but they were also like, it's a video game. Like just like not, not in a terrible way, but just in that kind of, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And like, don't, you know, get too excited. But I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is special. And, um, and then, yeah, I auditioned uh, with the casting director over Zoom. It was my first Zoom audition. And the laptop was on top of like a suitcase and I had my lights. And, and then after that, they called me back. I did another Zoom audition. And that time, Natalie was there, uh, Sam was there, and some of the producers and casting. And he directed me a little bit. And then we talked for like an hour. And, I was kind of sitting there thinking, do I have this job? Like, do I, is this happening? And then it ended, and then my agent was like, Sam wants to call you. And I was like, this is a great sign. And then we, we talked on the phone a few days later for another like hour, hour and a half, get off the phone. I'm like, I, don't, I still don't know if I have this job at this point. You know, I've spent so much time doing this. And then eventually, you know, I got the call that I had gotten it. And I was like, thank God. At that point, I was like, good, because 
come on. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, and then I had about, I think, six weeks to prepare, and then we were rehearsing and on set and shooting, so. So it's interesting, because I, I don't have much to compare it to. Um, I would say the, the whole one camera setup thing and the way that we shot this was very much like theater, actually, because we were doing these continuous takes that were, you know, between two and five minutes long, depending on the scene. You know you're not going to cut to someone else. You know, you're not getting a wide and a medium and a close-up. Like, you basically have to bring it all on the first take, and you're probably only getting two to three takes. Like, we really, that's how we shot 407 pages in, you know, 90 days, or however long it was, is we, you get a couple shots per scene, and then you're moving on. So. In that sense, it felt very much like theater because it felt just like being on stage in a play and you're live and you're performing and you can't redo it, you know? You're just doing it. And um, that was kind of fun. And it was, it, was, it was a challenge, but it was a challenge I think we were all very excited about. I seem to be a very uh, specific type. Um, a little bit scary. So I don't get a lot of auditions. I don't get, it's not like the girl next door or anything like that. It's, oh, here's an alien for you. Uh, here's a vampire. Here's a drug addict. Or here is someone that's very, very tortured or crazy. And it's like, in the beginning, I was like, why? Why do they just give me this? And now I've sort of embraced it. I was like, fine, okay, I can do that. I can be weird. But then it's, it's fewer and far between the auditions. So, which also puts that pressure on you of like, oh, I have to nail this. But it's also something that I'm like, oh, I can put something unique into it, like immortality. I got sent the audition, but I was sent Manon's audition material. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna send over the proper sides and then you'll come back tomorrow. So I, and she was like, she gave me some pointers as well of like the Tilda Swinton, David Bowie kind of thing. So I went full out, just Googled videos with David Bowie, talking about art and just like chain smoking. And it was really good for me because I totally brought that into the, uh, the audition. Oddly enough, I could take a lot from my life of feeling a little bit different, not really fitting in kind of feeling lonely, um, of uh, a hard time connecting with people because you have this side to you, this darkness or whatever it is. Like, I mean, I come from ballet and gymnastics and then you're in Hollywood and it's a constant nagging on your appearance and your body and you just start to hate yourself. Which is very much what this character is doing. Like, like the scene where when Candy says it was so poignant, she was like, I've come to hate this body and all that it requires from this world. And for me, that was just like, yeah, spot on. There is such a lot of scrutiny just on your appearances and everything. And um, so I could use a lot of that in the character. And then also the fact that, you know, I've experienced the male dominated industry and oh yeah let's let's meet let's have drinks let's fall in love and you're like mm, no, no i just wanted to have a business talk with you so the idea of me getting to be the one who actually goes just who, how old are you like what about you okay you tell a joke now you be the clown you do it One anecdote each cast member who spoke to us had was how much film history research director Sam Barlow encouraged the cast to do. Sam is a cinephile, but more than that, he's deeply interested in the stories behind the movies. Not just the stories that each era of cinema decided to tell, but how these stories were told. How they were filmed, marketed, edited and the way studios and directors treated the on-screen talent. So before we meet the rest of the cast, I think we should all go through the same process that the actors did. A film history 101 from the director himself, to get a better understanding of not only the three eras of movie making that we're going to spend time in today, but the dark secrets each of them is hiding behind the celluloid. There was a, a BBC, I think, interview with Olivia Hussey and her co-star, uh, at the time of the making of Romeo and Juliet, 
which was the Zeffirelli version, and they were both 15 or 14. Um, so that's recently in the news because, I mean, famously in that movie, I mean, we watched it in my like high school English class and it was this whole thing because you see some boobs and you see a butt and stuff, but it's now blowing up because they did not consent as, as 14 or 15 year olds to do semi-nude. But there was this interview with the two young stars from this BBC guy and he's like very old school BBC and he's interviewing them. And throughout the whole interview, Olivia Hussey is smoking a cigarette and at some point he comments on the fact that she's a, a 15 year old smoking and, and how weird and shocking that is. And she just gives him this look like, you have no idea what 15 year old girls are up to like. <laughs> um... I mean, that, that is pretty... Uh, there aren't many girls at 15, I know, that smoke cigarettes publicly. Oh, there are. And uh, what do your parents feel about that? But she has, like, throughout the whole interview, this... Like, she, she, she has a, uh, a kind of gravitas. And this, there was something about the way they were treating her almost like an alien. Like, she was this strange creature. There was something about the way that making her into a film star at that age and, and, and the airs of being an adult had, you know, gave her this this kind of vibe. And so they were treating it very strange. And there was another interview that I threw on my mood board that was um, David Letterman interviewing Phoebe Cates. And it was Phoebe Cates had done the kind of Blue Lagoon ripoff and Ridgemont High, Fast Times, and maybe Gremlins. And she's still very young. And the way that Letterman treats her in this interview, like, you could lock him up if this was 2022. It's obscene, like, the way he talks about her and about her age and the nudity and everything. And, and she's just having to, like, put on a smiley face and, and just kind of go along yeah. with it. Uh, now, in, in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, there's a little bit of uh, uh, nudity in it. I mean, you're nude for a little bit in there, aren't you? Yeah, topless. But, yeah, yeah, topless. Uh, but it, which is, it's a, Thank you. <laughs> it's a terrific scene, by the way, but it's... Uh, <laughs> Was that? <laughs> yeah. He looked very young in person. Yeah, everybody says that. Yeah, he looked like, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe? Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Now, you look very young in person. People always say that. You look, what, 15, 16? Maybe. So there was like this little germ there of, what if inside there is this incredibly powerful, wise <laughs> creature that actually is like, I could fucking kill you. Like you know, not give it a happy ending, but like, how do you kind of twist this power dynamic? And it became kind of then very tied up with, I was obsessed with the extremely tragic and sad story of Jean Seberg, who, as I think she was 16, as a 16 year old was cast with no prior experience in Otto Preminger's Joan of Arc movie. And at the time, and some of this is kind of riffed on in Immortality, at the time, there was this huge kind of media frenzy where he was casting for this role and he saw thousands and thousands of young women and her being cast, like they, there was, um, it was the big like Tonight Show equivalent at the time. They announced the winner and she was brought out on stage and kind of paraded in front of people. And then her experience of shooting that movie was horrific because she was like, hey, I would love some acting lessons. I want to look. And she was like acting opposite people like John Gilgood and stuff. Like she was surrounded by experts performing this uh, this incredible play. And he was like, "You don't need acting lessons. I will sculpt you. I will make you great." And he was a complete dick to her, to the point where the scene where Joan of Arc is burned at the stake, she they actually fucked up, and Jean Seberg was set on fire. So that that was horrific for her. And then she had to make a second movie with Preminger, uh, which was Bonjour Chassez. Um, and then she has uh, the break of being in Goddard's Breathless. And that's kind of what she's known for and is most iconic. Um, but then after that, like, her career is extremely sad. Uh, she never quite gets the kinds of roles she wants or deserves. At a very kind of wish fulfillment level, it's like trying to take that story and, and take something, like transform it a little bit. Still kind of engage with you know, knowing that this game was going to be, at this point, about cinema and certainly like the, the 20th century version of cinema and the history of cinema. Um, and like early on, we weren't completely sure what eras we were going to be kind of straddling. 
I understand there are quite heavy love scenes in this picture. Is that something you find uncomfortable? Well, I think those scenes are there for a reason. Thinking about like Ambrosio and the original book, The Monk, and the extent to which that book is essentially a film noir. Like you have the, the authority figure, the cop, who is in this a monk, who's, who's supposed to be you know, the most moral and kind of you know, upholding all of the laws. And then he's introduced to the femme fatale, Matilda, who essentially then just like destroys him and makes him commit every crime under the sun. But thinking about like the extent to which that book from like the 17th century sets up, you know, it has this tradition and all the tropes of being a film noir. And then when thinking about actresses and the restrictions on them as artists and, and all the stuff that goes with that, thinking about like pre-code movies and early film noir, there's this kind of interesting contradiction there of the actresses playing the kind of femme fatales in these classic film noirs. On one hand, actually, here you have female characters that have a huge degree of agency. They are actually the prime drivers of the plot. They are getting to do things and be bad and kill people and win. And they have sexual agency and they, you know, they are the most interesting characters and, and the best roles in those movies. And, and on the other hand, that role exists to titillate men. Like the femme fatale is there as, you know, this kind of sexy, bad, naughty thing. So and, and identifying that that role existed in Ambrosio, once we started to kind of solidify things, we knew that we wanted to have this jump between Ambrosio and, and Minsky that was kind of this evolution from the studio system. And what was really interesting there was, and, and again, going back to those kind of femme fatale characters, was in the studio system, if you're an actress, you were the property of the creation of the studio, right? You had so little agency. But the interesting thing was that the jump between that system and there was this, and I had internalized this as well, this idea that when the old studio system died and we went to the new Hollywood, right? So we went to the Friedkins and Scopolas and the Scorseses and all these kind of real 70s movies with their ambiguous endings and their kind of more human, organic kind of stories going on. There was this idea that that was in some ways an improvement, but really if you dug into it, it's like, well, the studio is no longer sculpting people, but now you have a director who, who is probably sleeping with the actress as well as directing her. And, and that same kind of sculpting is happening. In the case of uh, Jane Fonda, she has this incredible trajectory where she decides to go and do Clute. And Clute is written as, uh, it's two guys and, and they're like screenwriters and they're like, hey, no one's written a really good like prostitute movie. Like, I think now's the time for that. So they set out to write this story about this sex worker. And along comes, you know, Jane Fonda, director, and she is looking for a piece of work that she can make significant and do like important acting in and, and kind of make her own. And she sees reflected in this character, like so much of her life. And at this point, she's in a relationship with Roger Vadim, the French film director, and she is so performatively sexual, like in, you think like Barbarella, uh, the two of them are having all these kind of big fun group sex things going on and stuff. And, and so there's no line between her as an actress performing on screen and what's going on. And, and it's so much tied up in like the 60s sexual revolution where there is this like fun lie that, that somehow uh, women have been granted the freedom of their sexuality. And then you kind of look back and you're like, actually the men seem to do really well out of that. Like the Roger Vadims were really benefiting from Jay Fonda's sexual freedom. Um, but she, she takes on Clute and there's this huge thing and th there's a little bit of this in the game, but like she cuts her hair. You know, Roger Vadim's like, what are you doing cutting your hair with this, you know, ugly short, short haircut? Like, I didn't give you permission to cut your hair. But with Clute, she has this haircut which becomes iconic. And there are these incredible moments in Clute, which were not in the original script, where the character is in therapy. And all of these therapy scenes were added by Jane Fonda and it's her talking about being Jane Fonda. So you watch them and like everything she's saying is her figuring out her life and what's going on with her and her agency and all these things. That to me was like, you know, this would have been beautiful if like Gene Seberg had that route out and been able to, to, to kind of find that. But 
then really like the story of the game became on one level taking the the very classic femme fatale role in ambrosia where she is literally the devil like she's literally the sexy devil and then in minsky we have like a proto-erotic thriller where she is technically she's the femme fatale but uh, the character marissa really wants the character of Franny to be imbued with more humanity. Here is a, 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 to some extent, a murder mystery, but we want you to root for the murderer, right? Like it's, and there's that kind of ambiguity. Like if a lot of this was me revisiting that idea of 70s New Hollywood as being like the dream, right? Of like, oh, this was when the real art was being created. This was the high point of cinema. And then kind of interrogating that and being like, well, we think of these guys as auteurs, but like Friedkin didn't want to direct The Exorcist. He was like, this is some pulpy paperback. Coppola didn't want to direct The Godfather. Again, both of these guys were like 20th on the list. And the studios are like, hey, we got this extremely successful book. Can you adapt it? And it's like, yeah, I want to do my own shit, right? I want to do my original things. And so there was that kind of interrogating on my part anyway of the 70s. So then like the 90s was really interesting because for me, like, you know, the 80s was that kind of trash era where everything was horrible and cocaine and money. And then in the 90s, you have this new wave of young filmmakers who idolize the 70s. So they're trying to, and I think like even Tarantino's like on the record as saying like, oh, the 90s was actually kind of our 70s. Uh, but you have, you know, Thomas Anderson, people like that, trying to make things that either directly evoke the 70s or at least in that kind of moral ambiguity or ambition or darkness evoke the 70s. And you also have like the neo-noir thing that pushes through the 90s, which ties us back. So then the idea of like two of everything is, well, now the format has shifted. So actually now the protagonist is both the the kind of perpetrator and the victim and the revenger. And so it's kind of this neo-noir and it's still like the same problems are still there. In fact, it's even worse, right? Like the villains in Two of Everything who are the epitome of like money and power and everything that is rotten in our world. And this was, we were doing all this before the Epstein stuff, like blew up. He assaulted me, Maria. You're a big girl. You of all people should know the score. For me, the spark of Two of Everything was seeing a video of Jennifer Lopez do a birthday performance for this Eastern European oligarch. I, I think this video is online and, and I'm like, you know, and this was like at the height of her fame. So it's like she is one of the most powerful and rich and successful singers doing her thing. But she's flying over and she, she not only like did some songs for his birthday, but delivered this impassioned speech about how much she loved him and was grateful to be there. And then said, I'm now gonna perform a song that I've never performed in public before, just for you. And I was like, oh, talk about like selling your soul. There's, there's taking the money and then there's taking the money and being like, this is the first time I've performed this song live just for you. Like to me, I was like, that's so corrupt. So really that's, you know, the story of two of everything is, you know, there are two characters in it, but if you treat this essentially as the same character and, and you know, one part of them is, has been broken they lose their innocence and, and that is the sign of them that's punished and they ultimately kind of overcome that. Taking a short break. I'm helping a friend. The stage has been set, so let's meet our players. Casting for Immortality began in early 2021 ahead of a summer filming window, but the COVID-19 Delta variant would have something to say about that later in our story. Pre-production for Immortality had been long and detailed. Sam and the production team had not only written the script for the game, but full scripts for each of the three fictional movies therein, even though only select scenes from one camera perspective were ever going to be shown. They also outlined the elements within each frame that would constitute the match cuts that the game would use to navigate you to different scenes. All of this information along with call times and shooting schedules were stuffed into one huge binder known on set as the monster. All the while the game team was working through prototypes of this technology. We have a lot to cover here from the sets to costumes, the role of the intimacy coordinator and much more, but let's start by meeting some of the cast and learning what they thought of their time filming Immortality. I remember Sam's telling me about this kind of concept and understanding that he had this 
he had this vision of all these things coming together and, and just kind of being like, wow, this is, if he can pull this off, this is going to be special, you know? This to me was kind of this marriage of film and game, but even something more to that in the sense that it, it almost makes you feel like you're a part of it somehow, like with the music and the way you're controlling it. The funniest thing is the actor is actually my good friend Michael Otis who played Terry, the rich guy in the third film. Uh, he's, he's scumbag. He's the, the scumbag guy, yeah. <laughs> so he, he's actually a good friend of mine and he got the audition before me. They'd already cast John Durick and he got the audition for, for that role and so I helped him read that role. So that was my introduction to it and all of a sudden, it might have been three weeks to a month later, this role comes in for John Durick from the same project and I was like, oh wait, this is a cool role and it was, you know, the director. I felt like there's some roles where it, it feels like really hard to get into and then there's some things that just, it's just like fits. It just, you, you, the second you read it, the second you, it just, it just works and it fits and uh, I felt that with John Durek. I felt the second I saw that, I was like, all right, this is cool. And I even, the way it was, I think my audition scene was the one where Manon is looking at herself in the mirror and then she, she comes to me. And then, and then I had the scene where I'm uh, smoking on the talk show, you know? And it, in, in the audition, he doesn't tell you what the whole story is. It just gives you kind of a small bite-sized piece of what it is. But I could tell there was something much deeper to what was going on. So I put some stuff on it. I had a lot of fun playing with those things. For the, the scene with Manoa where she shot me in this, I decided to take it on the floor. So it was as if I was in a bed and then I decided to look to the camera and look right into the camera like that um, because I knew she was going to be holding it you know, without know. knowing how the game worked or anything. So I think that intuition, that intuition kind of led to probably Sam and them seeing it and being like, oh, this guy gets it. So it's funny because when you tell people from the film industry, any film industry professional, oh yeah, I've been in this video game, the answer is always like, okay, cool. Um, and then you show them what it looks like and they're like, that's a video game? That, and, and they're like fascinated. And then that's when they start asking questions about it. People have this preconceived idea of what a video game is. And so they don't really take it seriously. Or n the acting in it, they don't really take it seriously. But then they see it. The initial audition that I got, it was that audition scene that you also see in, in the game and I had so much fun doing that and then I didn't hear back for I think literally two months. And I was like ah dang I didn't get that one. <laughs> then I got the phone call and my agent was like yeah so um, they want you for the part and we're start they start in like three days and I'm like I looked at the script, didn't get it at all. I was like, okay, can I, can I talk to Sam? And then Sam wanted to talk to me anyway, so we got on a Zoom call. It instantly put me at ease, because quite honestly, I was quite freaked out. Because there was the Italian accent, there was, I was playing Sofia, but I was also playing Antonia. And then there's like more levels to this than just like, you know. And so I just needed someone to explain it. And that's what he did. And then I felt better. And then a couple days later, we had the first table read. And uh, I just had to jump in. Yeah, I didn't have time to overthink. So many of our roles was like, it was like our first pick. Like so many of the people that we ended up being able to work with, it was just like magic as soon as we saw them. And we knew, like Ty, as soon as we saw Ty for, for Carl, we were like, that's Carl. That's 100% Carl. Miles for, for Ambrosio and Robert. It was total magic. Immortality came around just as a regular self-tape. Apparently I was actually submitted for a role in the first movie, but the casting directors knew me and were like, no, he'd be better as Carl. So my manager switched it and I auditioned. And there wasn't even a callback, I don't think. It was just that one tape. And I was thrilled when I got it. I was actually scouting for a, a short that I was doing with people from San Francisco Ballet that I was directing. And I remember on the scout, I got the, uh, not even a call, I just got an email. And I was like, oh, this is sweet. Cause I remember seeing the lookbook and uh, I had a few scenes that I could read. And one of them was the, uh, that um, Club 88 
you know, and I remember being like, oh, I hope this isn't a rehearsal. I hope we actually get to shoot it and go in that club and, you know, and so that was like, that was just so cool. It was different because, you know, Carl Greenwood was the actor and he's this guy from LA who's trying to get into different kinds of movies. He was modeled after kind of a Clint Eastwoody kind of guy. So he's had some success and he wants to get in the new wave. He's tired of the projects he's being offered. So he wants to meet this hot new young director named Durek. And so I think he really just wants to be a part of this new kind of wave of filmmaking. And originally I would get the script and it was all out of order because it's all chronological with the, the dates and the world how we're shooting, you know what I mean? So this is a screen test, this is a location scout, this is, you know. So I was trying to piece the script together and then finally I was like, Sam, do you have like just a script of Minsky so I don't have to keep like doing this? And he does. So then I could just do work on the film, you know, which was very like uh, a lot of clue inspiration, you know. What really, really helped was costume and the set and also the other actors. It's extremely hard when you're just alone at home in your apartment and you're trying to rehearse it by yourself. But once you have your surroundings and you have your director and you, you get to speak with everyone on set, that's when you kind of get a feel for what the story is. Especially for Antonia, we had the most incredible sets. It was really easy to get into that era because suddenly you were in a humongous church and, and, and the clothes, the dresses, and that really, really, really helped. You just drop in. You allow yourself to play with your imagination and just let yourself just fall into that. So this is the costume and wardrobe binder from uh, what originally was called Project Ambrosio, but that was before. That was the secret title. That was the secret title, yeah. yeah. So that was our code name. For all of it, we're talking about? Yeah, all of it. for yeah. all of it. We called it Project Ambrosio. So all of our rentals and everything were under that mm. name, all of our accounts. Yeah. So this is the shooting script for Immortality, which was uh, 406 pages. Um, and this doesn't include the three additional scripts that were the um, film the scripts of the fictional films that were being made even the unshot scenes, even the unshot scenes. so it's a full script of a film that we did not make uh, but we needed to be familiar and read th those scripts because we were essentially the designers not only of immortality but of each individual film so this is the, the the shooting script like I said 406 pages then we move on to the day out of days report which is what we use to determine which actor is going to be on set which days and this one they're usually two pages this one is 10 and you can see how many characters there are and these are their kind of start work finish this is the yeah the plan of who is, what actor is on set which days and it goes on and on <laughs> this is our strip board so this is our shooting schedule which changed constantly yeah right? I don't know which version this is right? yeah oh yeah we had a lot just, of COVID issues yeah but what's really unique about this one and you can kind of see on here for instance we have Marissa we have the several Marissas. So we have Marissa as Franny, and that one is one FR. Then we have Marissa as Heather, because in Two of Everything, she plays two characters. So we have Heather, Marissa as Maria, Marissa as Matilda, Marissa as Rosario, et cetera. And all of the characters going forward have that as well. We also have abbreviations for whether they're part of Ambrosio, Minsky, or Two of Everything. And then I have uh, some of my costume research. So we have just references for film crews in Italy in 1968. These are real film crews in Italy around that time, um, just to kind of see what people wore, you know, in the summer and the, you know, sort of more rural parts of Italy. And it was obviously very different from, you know, what the fashion would be here. And we have Marissa Marcel, so you can kind of see how she starts out her journey as a, a more of a commercial, you know, typical American teenager. I, I used a lot of Sears Roebuck from 1968, and then she ends up by the time she finishes shooting uh, Ambrosio, she's a little bit more of a femme fatale. You know, she's got the Bridget Bardot. She's got a little bit more of that that European sort of flair that she she's kind of- She's worldly now. She's more worldly, yeah, which, which she picks up from Sophia um, in, the, in the, the script. And we have, you know, Fisher and Durek, who are all kind of conglomerations, as Steph said, of real producers and directors. We've got Sophia here, who's definitely a little more mature, a little more worldly. And Robert, who, you know, these, this research was done before casting was finalized. Right. So what we ended up with as far as Robert's image was very different from what we had originally talked about. We had originally talked about sort of a boy next door, all American, um, James Dean sort of feel. And he ended up being a little bit more Topanga Canyon. Yeah, more kind of like Robert Redford. Yeah. Or like, but like that, a, that was just informed by, by Miles, the actor, and, and how he carried himself and 
how his character sort of developed, which happens often, you know, in costume design. Here come the monks. Here come the monks. Yeah. So they were a real order of monks, uh, the Capuchin monks, but they wore these kind of brown uh, habits, and that was not what Sam wanted. He wanted a, a cream color, partially because there was going to be a lot of blood, there was going to be a lot of contrast. He really wanted to kind of play with colors, and that's another thing that you see if you watch The Devils. There's um, a red, white, and black sort of triad of colors that he found very symbolic and very uh, connected to the time period. So we wanted to use that, and then we also wanted to, to do that because it allowed for the red and the greens to come out, which were our two main sort of mm -hmm. symbolic colors that we were adding. Yeah. Um, I did this thing that I really enjoyed throughout Immortality with the fashion, with the costume design, where I would take something that was an iconic fashion moment that actually happened a few years later, and I would have our designer introduce it. So we we're kind of rewriting history where we're at the cutting edge or whatever. And one of those things was the Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress, which became really popular in 1974. Mm -hmm. So I had our designer kind of build the green dress off of it, off of a sort of a Spanish hybrid with the wrap dress. So originally it was because functionality, you know, I had to build this dress that she could drop like a robe, that she could have nothing underneath, that could be very ethereal and, and kind of an angel and a demon at once, but also period costume from the moment. So we brought that in and then these were, oh, this is great. This is a very early, I don't know if you can show all this, but it's a very early uh, prototype mood board of the Proteans, far before we ever got to our, our final sort of design for them because Sam was kind of like, I don't know what they are yet. I want to talk about it. So I said, okay, I'll put some ideas together. Of course, we ended up more in this world of kind of gauzy fabric, um, but there was a place called the void, which, you know, a lot of their scenes take place where, which is nowhere and no, there's no, no time. So we didn't have, you know, a period reference for that at all. Yeah, Sam really like, it was interesting again, going like back through this. So they had all these Slack channels, like one for everything, like story development, references, movies, wardrobe design, production design. And it was interesting, I went back recently and like scrolled all the way back. And this goes back, like they were working on this years before we were ever, ever even hired, you know, and seeing the conversations as they developed and the references that they talked about were kind of androgynous, you know, they're not male or female, very like David Bowie. Do they have human forms or do they have alien forms? Do they have, you know, do they even have genitalia? Like yeah. well, how, what, do they have mouths? Like what do they, how do they function? Yeah, there was a lot of yeah, that. Yeah, but then you, I mean, it resulted in that really cool look of, you know, the bleach blonde, slick back hair, you know, like it actually became kind of, to me, like a very iconic. Oh yeah, know. and the, the, the gold fabric and. Mm. But I guess you are more familiar with the role of the seducer. Look, I, I can act. I wanted to do this picture because I wanted to do something a little different. I feel like if I don't show the other side, I think with the whole studio set up, it's on the way out. I don't want to do historical epics, you dig? I, I want to get in this new wave. Has a woman ever said no to you, Carl? And meant it. <laughs> I had a few days of rehearsal in June, and then I went back, and then we started shooting on August 2nd. And I think we shot for like two and a half weeks, maybe. It was really fast. We would, we would shoot like between 10 and 20 pages a day. Manon and I, we would FaceTime a lot before, you know, like going over scenes and just making sure that like, you know, which I requested. And I was off book, you know, weeks before because if we were shooting that in two weeks, you know, I want to just get to think about what I'm doing and not about the lines. And so I, I, I memorized that well in advance. But then when we were there, you know, Manon also has a theater background. And so I think it was just like, you know, we do a few takes of it. It is what it is. We try to get as much as we can, but also if there are any, I don't know, if anything is imperfect, that's part of the game, you know? Because this isn't the take that they necessarily use for the movie. Or if they do, they use like five seconds of it, you know? Or if it's behind the scenes, so if there's ad-libbing or something goes wrong, that's all part of, like, that's what makes the project special, you know? Myself and a couple other actors begged Sam for rehearsal time with text because we were like, oh my God, like especially with Ambrosio, it was like, we need to rehearse this. We can't just like show up and do this without having rehearsed it. So Sam very kindly, he didn't have a lot of time to do this, but did a couple sessions with some of us. I was meeting with some of the actors also before we would shoot and just rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And that felt like drama school because it's like, okay, you're preparing for scene study. You're doing a scene from, you know, a Summer and Smoke by Tennessee Williams and you have to rehearse it before you show it to your teachers because you don't want to fail out of the class, you know. So that's kind of how it felt is like 
we did our own kind of makeshift theater rehearsal. And then um, hopefully it shows, because I think I would not have been prepared to just jump in and be doing, or like, you know, all the Franny scenes with Carl, like without any rehearsal or speaking to Ty about that beforehand, like would have been so weird. So yeah, it worked out. When I first read it, I was very overwhelmed. Like how, how on earth do I play this character? And then once I, started working on it, it was surprisingly easy to connect with it. I want to believe the best in humanity, very much like the one who's, you know, seen the worst. I did so much work just on my own, you know, black void or dances or just talking to myself. Um, and that did give me that separation of like, I mean, feeling of loneliness and wanting to connect and it's just not happening. It was hard when we were filming, but it was very helpful for the character. In the moment, and I'm not talking about method acting, any kind of acting you're doing, in the moment, your body doesn't really know the difference between what you are performing and what is actually happening. So when you do shoot traumatic scenes, intense scenes, whatever, like you, you kind of have to have, what I've found is you, you have to have support and a routine to kind of like leave that behind because your body is going through it. Your body d thinks that it's real. And so that can be really grueling and really exhausting um, to go through. And um, I'm not a method actor. Um, I think it's important to retain the, your essentially like, um, uh, like ringmaster in your head that knows how to keep yourself safe, keep the other person safe, do the scene but then also be in it as much as you can be. And that's kind of this like very, it's a balancing act. The stuff where it counts to really be there emotionally present, you have to do that because there has to be something actually, you know, feeding that flame. And yeah, the, way of, the ways of getting there for me really vary, but I think in terms of like what I tell myself, I, I do a lot of just like, let it go, like let it go and I'm here with this person. And I'm, most of the time I can even like, I mean, I just, I love, people and just by looking at someone I can I'll just start crying or I'll start doing it now like I'll start crying I'll start laughing whatever it is like when you're there in the moment with someone you just have to be present and and hope that everything that you worked on is remains you know but you can't be like doing it as you're doing it ha you have to whew, just let it go but I did have I mean if you saw my script it's like seven different colors of highlighter and post-its and things just to track like okay where am I Marissa? Where am I another character? At what stage am I, of Marissa's life am I playing these characters? When is her acting good, better, best? When is her acting bad, which at the beginning like it is? And then where is she at in her day? And then her relationship to the, the people she's acting with, just like with anything else, it's like we're doing this, but also our mind is doing a thousand other things, so. How important do you think, was it for you maybe to like have your eyes on that grander subtext because in a way i can imagine it could also kind of flood you with like too much yeah and I, I think sam was very particular in in not giving too much and not making us think too much we'd come up and i'd ask him a question and he'd look at me and kind of just go yeah okay let's try it and so in a sense, it was, he, he allowed each of us to kind of take it on ourselves and do what we wanted to do with it. But I, th I think he had such a, it was A, so well written that I think it was hard to stray too much from, I think, his grand scheme of what it was. It was the first time that I've, I felt he knew what he was doing in the sense of the story so well that you just, you were, you felt free to just kind of go. Um, and he trusted everyone to, to bring their version of it and, and do it. And it never, it always felt very playful and very easy to do, effortless in the sense that it, there wasn't this crazy pressure to make, make it happen the right way. You could tell he was open to different things happening. And I think that lent itself to uh, some pretty magical stuff. People talk about like inside out or outside in acting, essentially, where it's like you're either, you know, you're thinking of something sad to make you cry or you're thinking, of, you know, whatever, or you're doing something physical and then that leads to the emotion. I think um, I've done both and I do both and it just kind of depends on what the scene is. And there's also stuff that's easier to fake, like technically to just 
to do a scene and uh, especially when you're shooting you know uh, 14 pages a day and you're doing all of these you know you can't necessarily be giving your whole heart and soul and blood and guts to every single scene so there's some things where because I have the training to do this you it's not you're not um, it's not like you're giving a half-assed performance but you're doing it sort of technically um, and then, but I think the, the stuff where it counts to really be there emotionally present, you have to do that because, you know, the, whoever is watching, they're, people are so smart and, you know, their mirror neurons are firing watching you. If you. That's why I think sometimes you watch a performance where someone's screaming and crying and, oh my God, it looks like, wow, and you feel nothing. And sometimes, as an audience member, sometimes that's because, you know, bad directing, bad writing, bad editing. But sometimes it's because that actor is... Uh, it's uh, it's technical and it's not real, and so like it, ha there has to be something actually, you know, feeding that flame. You booked me a birthday party. No, listen. Should I go grab some fucking balloon animals? You don't even know who it's for. It's a fucking birthday party. It's Andrew Hessenberg's birthday. Who is that? <laughs> Are they shooting on film? No, no, all no. of this isn't done in post. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. But I, I, they have different true. cameras and stuff. Yeah, they did do they did use different lenses and cameras that were more specific to the time. But they that is true. they had it all yeah. figured out. Oh, that's got to be a filter though. It like, is a, yeah. But I have to say, even on set, sometimes we would like watch playback, and it would already look like amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Even You're like the, the eight mil stuff or the, the yeah, that was on a Black Magic, I think. Oh my god. Uh, 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 yeah. Pocket yeah. cinema camera, yeah. Did you did you actually film anything yourself at all? Did I what? Film, because there's scenes where you're fi you're supposed to be filming. Oh no, 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 no. Not, Oh no, she's not actually doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doug, the camera, uh, the, the amazing DP, is is like right here, and I'm right behind him trying to make it seem like. Yeah, right. And then with, with Hans, when it was Doug shooting, and it's supposed to be Hans, it's this crazy thing where at some point you see Hans's camera in the in mirror, the mirror. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. him it's Doug it like was, two inches oh, away yeah, from him. Oh, we gotta find that sitting scene. beside him I'm sitting yeah. right on him really? like <laughs> literally <laughs> right here yeah it's so crazy and I'm like we're doing all these tricks and yeah. I'll go I'll go to him yeah. so it's like at the beginning you're like oh yeah look he's yeah. shooting and it's yeah, not it looks like he's filming. Yeah. 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 Doug pre-developed basically the the looks for each of the types of um film we were going to have and that was done in pre-production we basically had a month of pre-production with all of our department heads ahead of the video production and what he was doing at the time was working closely with Anna our um, colorist uh, in developing these sort of looks all of those different looks were pre-developed and then when we had our selects that's when we'd go in and we refined everything. So Sam was finally able to like make our daily select. Cause the video production was so, so demanding that typically, you know, for Sam on Telling Lies, he was able to make selects as he was going um, so that, you know, post production could be working in advance. Immortality was such a demanding video production, not only just in substance, but shooting through COVID. Um, we were not anticipating shooting through COVID, which is why we had decided to shoot. And then um, the Delta variant uh, hit LA like the week we started filming. Well, we did shoot the whole thing chronologically in terms of how, not the movies themselves, but how Marissa and, and co shot them. So essentially, aside from a couple scenes, we were shooting through the script chronologically. We, thank God, because otherwise I would have lost my mind. I don't think I could have done I don't think I could have done it if it, if I was changing not only between you know Marissa and wh whatever character she's playing, but like different moments in time in her life, and like it was actually very helpful to play it through chronologically. And I think my experience just kind of mirrored like her experience, and so that was great. I'm really happy we did that. Ambrosio was shot on a soundstage mostly uh, in Sun Valley, California, and some in Woodland Hills, and then there was like one or two locations, the church and somewhere else. And then Minsky was shot in the Arts District on location, and then some other locations. And then Two of Everything, I think, was entirely on location in lots of places like this, um, which is uh, great. So yeah, a lot of driving around all around town. So the Arts District in Los Angeles mm -hmm. is where the- All of this was shot in LA, aside from, we did two days, I believe, in New York at the very, very end, where we shot all of the, um, 
exteriors for New York City that you see in Minsky. So like Hans on the rooftop and stuff like Hans that. Hans on the rooftop, Ty on the rooftop. Right. Everybody's on the rooftop, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the street in the West Village, like where we had to wait. You know, we only had 20 seconds to shoot that scene between Postmates people on bikes going by and, you know, modern, you know, Teslas and stuff. And <laughs> The sets were incredible. And, and the whole art department, wardrobe, I mean, a lot of that stuff is rented from like, you know, different, I don't know where they got it, but you know, like the studio, you know, I think some was from Universal and stuff, but it was all vintage. So you, you're in it and you're like, it, it, you just feel like you're from the 70s, you know? But then, yeah, we got to kind of own this, you know, three-story, you know, warehouse complex that we shot most of Minsky in. And it just looked like the old movies that we were researching, you know? But yeah, it was very hot. It was August in downtown LA in a warehouse and you can't have ventilation because you're filming. Right. So. <laughs> too, too loud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just found everyone involved in Immortality to be a true artist, craftsman. Like, I have so much respect and admiration and I'm just so wowed by what people like um, Carrie, you know, the head wardrobe did, uh, Doug on camera, all of these things. Like, I, coming in and doing camera tests was amazing, like putting on the, 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 the like early Marissa, you know, dresses and stuff and then, and then you know, having Doug shoot some stuff and then looking at it, I was like, oh my God, it looks, it already looks, and this is pre-color grading, pre, you know, any, you know, special effects, you know, happening happening in post, it already looks like we're, I'm in the 60s or something. And, and when we shot the first day, the first thing I shot was the audition scene and then watched it back on the monitor and was like, you don't even need to touch this. This looks like something on TV in like 1968. Like we're, we're good. So I just think that they, and Steph, you know, with all the production design, everything was so, so thoughtfully put together. Yeah, I mean, you know, you put the clothes on, you're in the space, everybody's wearing the stuff and you're just, you kind of don't even have to act because you're just like, here, here we are. <laughs> especially in a project like this, where people are really paying, they're clicking on every little thing. Like yeah. normally people might not see that or pay that much attention, but when you're freeze framing. Watching it 40 and you're, times. And you're going like, what can I click on? They are looking at every little, you know, a jacket on the floor. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, wait. Shoes. Film crews are used to, you know, being able to cut around, make cheats, things like that. We're like, no, everything's going to be on screen all of the time. Like you're going to see everything. And not only that, you're going to be able to pause, rewind, rewatch. So everything, and the point of the game is to scrutinize it, right? The point of the game is to scrutinize this material, look for the inconsistencies, because that's where some of the storytelling is happening in things that are meant to be odd or out of place. Um, so we can't have anything that's not designed to be odd or out of place. The, the game that Sam pitched me on in January of 2020 is the game that we made. Like in scope, scale, all of it. The game is so thoroughly designed, you know, we couldn't lose a scene. Again, this is something that film crews are used to, where they're like, oh, we just, we're not gonna get that scene. So how do we rewrite this or how do we work around this? That's not possible for us. Every scene is essentially a level that every other level is like dependent on because everything is linked and everything is connected. So we couldn't afford to lose a single scene. Ambrosio was the most difficult just in as far as scope of what we had to build and do, you know, because we're building uh, 1960s, like big studio sets, but they're supposed to look like a monastery. So it's kind of two layers where you have, okay, I need to build monastery sets, but they also need to look like 1960s studio sets. And we're filming in this sound stage and we had multiple sets going at simultaneously. So it's not like you just had one set. We had probably six or seven different sets going all at the same time. And literally as soon as one set would wrap, we were already like building, moving the next set, wrapping out that set, rebuilding a set in its place. Cannibalizing pieces from one set. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, I was reusing pieces from one set to another. And then it was also challenging because we have a lot of intimacy scenes. And when you have intimacy scenes, everybody has to clear out unless you are crucial. So I had to keep telling my crew to stop the work, leave the room, film the scene. And then they would like cut or we'd get a little break. And it's like, okay, go, 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 keep working. So that was difficult in that sense, but then, Minsky was hard in the sense that we're filming in this like old warehouse. Like what year, like 1920s warehouse Yeah, that's or definitely a, a, 
a turn of the century yeah. warehouse. And there's this old rickety elevator that you could only fit like a few items in. It was so slow. Otherwise, it was like it's... when you like pull a chain to go <laughs> up. Like, was, yeah, that yeah. was basically what it was like. Yeah, yeah so the, they're both challenging in different ways. Like Ambrosia because of the a ambition of it, but then Minsky just because of like the locations mm -hmm. and not having like a, a sound stage to film on. Yeah. The approach of having to design uh, a film that's take a costume drama that's being filmed in 1968 in Europe, I think it was Italy, right? Yeah. And having that be a, a production about something that happens in 19 or 1795. So the costumes are late 18th century, and the regular clothes everybody is in because we're seeing the rehearsals, we're seeing you know table reads, we're seeing. Um, you know, somebody with the, you know, clapping at the beginning of every yeah. shot. Rap parties, BTS. Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing real life as well for these these characters. So that is all happening in 1968. So there were layers of, you know, are they in costume? Are they in a scene in the movie? Is this completely off hours? You know, that kind of thing. And then on top of all that, having the supernatural layer, which <laughs> was there for everything. So that sort of exists not in anywhere in time, and then certain parts of that storyline do take place at very specific points in time. So it was a really a challenge to figure out where we were in time and space, mm -hmm. what the purpose each person had being there that day, and also which day it was, because just to add another la layer to it, <laughs> You know, you film multiple things in one day and you film different scenes over different days. So it might be the same scene in the movie that is being shot, but it might not be the same day in real life. So on the um, slate, yes. we had a date in 1968. So it would be, you know, August 15th, 1968. And then we would sh need to shoot something that is part of the same scene, but actually was shot the following day, you know, in August. So the person with you know, with the slate is changing clothes because it's a different day, but the actors aren't. <laughs> that serpent was certainly sent by God as a punishment. I know enough scripture to know the serpent is the devil's tool. Fake shaving, because you're oh, yeah. already clean shaven. <laughs> well, if, you, if you couldn't see, there's no beard under the uh, You can't tell. Shaving beard. There's no beard under that shaving? Can I see? No, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Movie, <laughs> nothing. Special effects. <laughs> But I get so sad, I'm invested, it's so funny, like playing this, I'm like, I wanted Marissa and Carl to work out. Yeah. I wanted, you know, the other one fucking ruins everything. <laughs> it's just like so it. sad. I want to see the movie. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Every acting class is different. And, and what I've found now, every, every student that goes into the class is different. And what I've found is you, you, can be a teach, you can be the best teacher in the world, and that student could get nothing from you or feel very small and, and not able to perform and do things. You could be a terrible teacher who has six people in there, but if you do something to make that actor feel comfortable, it can actually end up being a great class for them. It's all about the person and I call it like the artist, the inner child in them. And if they feel safe and in a place where they can be themselves. I'm the original of your Madonna. I'd hope to keep this secret. Bad acting on purpose. Yeah. How tricky, where do you go with that? Do you go to like <laughs> day one of Juilliard or like? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, wow, that's a good, I think Bill Hader does this beautifully on Barry. Um, <laughs> it's that thing where like, I don't know, I have a friend who's this incredible opera singer and he can sound like the worst singer in the world because he knows exactly what he's doing. So when he does off key bad singing, you're like, oh, because <laughs> he knows how to do that convincingly. Um, yeah, so I think it, it, it takes that level of just technical skill. But yeah, I mean, it was so easy for me to go back to like auditions, even, you know, before drama school. Like it's essentially what I think keeps actors back at, at, in those moments in their career are like fear and um, fear because you haven't done it enough to be comfortable, but also because maybe there's parts of yourself, you don't want to go there or there's like a, and I think it's funny because Marissa's having that experience in like, ooh, I want to explore this world of art and acting. I think we need a new Minsky. But I have an idea. There was something just in terms of like, the, the cool like movie making magic uh, that was so cool, which was all the stuff on the like desert cliff top with the beautiful hanging backdrop and the tree and the thing. And we were on this platform and uh, the wind and everything. And then, and then, um, 
and then Harleta comes in and does the same thing and then walks up the ramp. I mean, there's just stuff that like just still gives me chills like thinking about. And then, yeah, I mean, Minsky, I don't know, like, yeah, all, all the stuff, uh, the, the Franny, uh, Franny detective stuff was so fun. Cause you're just basically getting to live your childhood dream of being like Sharon Stone and like basic instinct and like fucking with someone. I mean, it's just so great. And then, um, yeah, two of everything. I mean, this was a rough night, but the drowning scene was a lot of fun because, um, you know, the water was quite warm actually. And you're just, it was intense, but you're kind of just like flapping around in a pool and it's it's fun. I don't know, so much of it was fun, it's hard to. <laughs> are, are those parts, because there's an, there's obviously like a drowning scene and there's also a a shoot the gun or the gun is shot or yes, whatever. Yes, yes. Um, was that a squib or was that a, presumably you can't shoot a blank that close to somebody. That would have been, no, you cannot, no, yeah. no, you cannot. You know, Brian, the props guy who was great, was, you know, showing us the gun. Like this is, you know, it's not loaded. Here, I'll shoot it at the ground. And then, you know, before, every time before we would do that scene, I would be like shooting it at the ceiling, like just to make sure, you know, because it's terrifying. and. And then we, we finally got it. But that was that was scary to do. And, and you know, you can't help but think that's the whole thing in the movie. It's, not, spoiler alert, like it's, that's what happens in the movie. It, we just heard about it, this awful tragedy happening on this other set. Like, I'm just so scared that this is actually gonna happen. And it didn't, yeah. so. Especially because his reaction is supposed to be one of shock. I'm actually dying. <laughs> yeah, like, like what? Yeah. And somebody shouts off set like, yeah. oh my God, or something. Or yeah, that. and and you know, it, he's so good, Ty's so good, and it's just like, you don't know in that moment if it's actually. <laughs> we had done that choreography before without the gun, and then on set was the first time we had that gun, and it was clearly a prop gun. It wasn't loaded. There was no way this gun could even like shoot anything. It wasn't built for that, you know? So yeah, and everyone passed it around, and we all saw, you know, the empty chambers, and. Um, but that was really just fun. Again, it felt like theater. It was like, can I hit, or a game, you know, you have like 15 levels you have and you gotta hit all of them. If one doesn't work, you're starting over and it all rides on you. <laughs> so like everyone's trying to make your performance look good. Do, do you like that? I loved it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even like the chess thing, like it's here and then we have to like do it a certain way, you know, and then Timothy has to mirror it and the whole, yeah, it's a big puzzle. That's, I really like acting for that. If specifically on camera acting for that reason. Because they knew I had a background in classical ballet. Um, like my dances are very much geared towards classical uh, ballet. And then we had a choreographer that we worked with. I don't know if Manon talked about that, but um, we would do, you know, six hour dance rehearsals and then sometimes go from shooting, then driving to the opposite side of LA to do a dance rehearsal, then drive back to finish the scene. So it was, incredibly intense and tiring, but, but it was, she was also really, really good. The worst thing was when I do the dance of the seven veils, that was incredibly difficult because the veils are completely loosely draped over me and I was supposed to pull them off without the other ones coming off as I'm dancing. And oh God, everything fell off. The take that we got, and I think we did it only in two takes. I was like, I just managed to catch one of them because it like, was falling off and I'm like <laughs> It was so difficult. It was so difficult. I think the, the Candy Says scene, I didn't have the music until the night before. So basically I'm driving to set the day of shooting and Natalie calls and I'm like, oh, by the way, this is the version that we're doing. And so I had like this like taped little cards that I was like trying to learn the lyrics and everything. So it was very much like, here we go. And then also the direction was, okay, so you, you're singing, you're not looking into the camera. And then once, you know, you stop singing, then you just completely break down. And those were my directions, which at first I was like, oh. and then I was in the song and it just happened naturally. Like the song is so powerful. And, and at that point I'd lived in the one for so long that it was just like, yeah. But seeing it afterwards, I am very proud of it. And it was done under a lot of stress. The only thing we really had rehearsal for was all of the intimacy stuff, which was, you know, kind of like, that's just like a non-negotiable. 
it was the first way that I met a lot of the actors I worked with, which is also always fun. Yeah. Um, but it does kind of break the ice. You're just like, okay, look, this is the deal. And, and we were lucky enough to work with a fantastic intimacy coordinator, Jean Fransblau, who was just amazing and really helped us, you know, establish clear boundaries and, and moves and stuff so that then we could just take it, like, you know, go really far with it. Um, which felt great and safe and the way that that should be done, you know, much like fight scenes or any other physical um, scene. And it's something that like kind of should be talked about more and, and, and elucidated, you know, so that the general public can sort of like grasp what it is because it is, it is very new and it's very important. There's, I think now a union of, or a guild of intimacy coordinators, that's very, very, like in the grand scheme of things, like maybe it's five years old or something like that, pretty new. Um, and yeah, I mean, their role, I think, is twofold. Uh, the first part is to create really f cool, fun, exciting, hot scenes. And then the other one is to keep the actors safe. And so both of those kind of go hand in hand. And then you're not stumbling with an actor you just met of like, OK, how do we do this and make it look, I don't know. And you don't have, you know, uh, in, Sam's not like this at all, but, you know, a director pushing you to do things you don't feel comfortable with, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, much like a fight scene, it's all just choreographed ahead of time. You, you work through it, you rehearse it, you talk about it. The first interaction I had with Jean was, um, a Zoom call where we, we, and she did this with all the actors involved in intimate scenes where, um, you know, we talked about, you know, what, what were my boundaries? What were my things I wasn't going to do and scene by scene. And that goes in terms of like nudity, like stuff like, you know, how long can we see this body part for in this scene? You know, in this scene, maybe we don't see this body part. What body parts are we not seeing? You know, and it's, da it's very like legalistic. It's very, very detailed. And so that was great. And then we, you know, went back and forth with Sam and Sam, you know, to his credit was very willing to change things to make us comfortable and to make it, you know, because it's that thing of like, sure, I'm down to do all of this stuff, but I have to do it in a way where I feel good about it. So things did change. Some things were cut. And ultimately, I feel really happy with what it all was. And I think also with intimacy, like it's interesting because you can never really get away from like, I mean, maybe in certain instances, but like the male gaziness of it all. But what I have to say about that is that for me personally, I think there's a difference between scenes of sexual violence and scenes of ex fun sexuality. And I think that even, you know, and I got to do mostly scenes of like fun sexuality. And those actually ended up feeling like quite fun and empowering because I was working with these people who were who wanted to tell that story and wanted me to be comfortable and want, you know, like that and convey this story of like Marissa's own experience with sex and, and her sexuality and the men in her life and the women in her life, et cetera, and tell that story. But without, I didn't feel exploited in any ways. Well, I, uh, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. I had 16 nudity writers to sign and, um, and having Jean, our intimacy coordinator, Jean Francois, was absolutely pivotal to being able to do this. She, um, just because she, she normalized everything. Uh, she made it into something that was beautiful and she was so on our side. There was no like, she was just on our side to the point where like, I don't even care if I need to halt production, like this will gonna take another hour I'm gonna make sure that you're comfortable. And that made it, like, then you feel like, okay, you're a protected individual. Working with the intimacy coordinator was great. And she was there almost all days on set because given the nature of what we're doing in the scene, there's, you know, nine times out of 10, there's a scene that involves some kind of that. But it was nice that there was some security. We could have very free conversations, whether it's about the modesty garments we're wearing um, or the actions or the choreography or whatever. and. It was this very seamless process where, you know, she would come to us. First, we would rehearse it in advance. That was what those rehearsal days were for before we shot were fight choreography and intimacy scenes. So we had already like established what was okay and what wasn't. Um, but then, yeah, she would come to our, um, our room like an, a half hour, an hour before we were about to shoot. And then we kind of walk through it and say, is there anything you're not comfortable with, whatever. And so she was the liaison between all that. So then when we're actually shooting, it was very like, open and there was no problem with crew or you know it was just about the story and kind of what worked you know with it and certain scenes like the bathroom scene that was one of the last things we shot and that actually i think of all the scenes we did that was very technical that's the most takes we did 
but Manol and I have a great friendship. And I think, yeah, we probably did like 10 takes of that. But each time we'd reset, it was really just the choreography. And then you kind of like breathe. And we only had like 30 seconds to reset. But you just kind of like breathe. You, you check in with the other person, you're okay. And then it was just a seamless process. Once production on the films was complete, the post-production phase began. Here the shots are selected, coloured and given the visual treatment required to set them in each era. These styles were based on tests the director of photography Doug Potts had done before principal photography. The audio was given a similar treatment, with all of the vintage stylings being applied in post-production. Sam and Natalie embarked on the process of tagging each scene with match cuts to different clips, all the while trying to manage the business side of the game's release. Immortality was an FMV game featuring a bunch of new faces on a new intellectual property. Much like a movie wants to get into as many theatres as possible, they need to get this on as many platforms as possible. I mean, our motivations when, you know, thinking about our publishing um, partners and our launch partnerships was Sam and I knew that if Immort if we could just get immortality in people's hands, the, the experience would speak for itself. That was very much at the forefront of our minds when thinking about the launch strategy was how do we get this into as many hands as possible. When we, when we started talking to Netflix, that seemed like the most natural partnership with all of this in mind is like we can marry you know, people who are obviously already film lovers because they have Netflix subscriptions and uh, access, like we can be in everyone's pockets. Uh, with Game Pass, it was a really similar thing. I think the thing that Game Pass ended up offering us was so many people gave Immortality a try without having been fans of Sam before or, or recognizing Sam, but maybe not have, having tried his games yet. So much of the feedback we saw after, you know, uh, the Game Pass thing was, I've never played these types of games before. I gave this a chance and you've, it's like mind blowing. Like you've got to play this. And that was such uh, a valuable thing for us was to capture so many new players through Game Pass um, that wouldn't have given the game a try otherwise. You can tell from talking to the cast and crew of this game that the process of working on Immortality was worthwhile in and of itself. There's a lot of positivity around the collaborations that happened on set and the work that was achieved. But the reason they're so excited to talk about the game today is what happened next. With any independent film, as with any independent game, success is something that's not expected, but certainly dreamt of. The reviews started coming in like the the night of like the 29th into the 30th because they were all coming out of Europe. So I woke up and I had and there were all these reviews and they were like this is the best thing ever masterpiece, you know, uh, game changer. You know, it was it was wild. And across gaming publications and entertainment publications and that was amazing to see my name in like Vulture and like, you know, The Guardian. And then it came out. It was available on Xbox like a few hours later like that afternoon. And I um, had gotten out and bought an Xbox because I was like, I don't want to wait to play this and I can write this off and my taxes, on, or I can try. Um, yeah, I just, I spent a lot of time playing it. Friends came over, very, you know, different groups of people came over that day and that week and we were playing, there's so much to play through, you know, playing through it. And, and I was just astonished at what they had actually done because when we were shooting it, of course, we understood intellectually like how it was all gonna come together, but also it had never been done before and none of us were gamers at that point in time. So it wasn't until we actually, I actually played the thing that I was like, I don't even understand how they did this and it works beautifully and perfectly. And then the first moment where you see you know, Harleta pop up, it like full body chills, even knowing it was gonna happen. I knew every scene where it could happen. I was trying, I was like going back and forth in China. Uh, Ty, what was your favorite scene to film and uh, why was it the cross-dressing? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay, that happened suddenly. This project, it could, people have said, oh, I would love to see the movie of Minsky. It's like, me too. But this is a game and there's a reason it's a game and it, like this is how this story must be told and I think it's a beautiful thing that this medium like exists for that. You know Manu and I we played it together the first time because she she went and got an Xbox and we didn't have we had a PlayStation <laughs> so <laughs> we started playing it and the first time I pop out we literally jumped off the couch 
we knew it was coming. We were like, okay, it's gonna switch now. And we were both like, ah, yeah. So, which was great because then you're like, we know what's coming and we're still terrified. <laughs> so. <laughs> Did you not see anything of the final pieces of this stuff until the game is out or? Sometimes like the hair and makeup, they would film the screen for us. And so I would see something or Sam would send me a picture like with the snake scenes and stuff like that. But otherwise, I, I really had no idea. I didn't know it was going to be black and white. I didn't know if people were ever going to see me. I, because in all the trailers and everything, it's all Manon. And there, I've, I've been there for three months and I'm like, no one's ever going to find me. And I did all of this. And, and my boyfriend was like, no, you're the point of the game. You have to find, they have to find you. I was like, no. And then it came out and there were this, all these wonderful people like, these gamers online that, that really dove into my character, which was beautiful and lovely. And uh, I have to say the whole gaming society is, is, a, is a wonderful society and, and been very supportive and outspoken with like their, their support and appreciation. So that was like, oh, okay. In my dark moments, I can go to that YouTube channel and just like. <laughs> I found myself falling into just watching the stories. But then I was like, well, maybe this is just because I was a part of the process so much. Maybe I'm, but I found myself like diving into every little detail of it. And one of my favorite things at, at, at the time when the game came out was, you know, going on like Reddit and different forums where they talk about what was your moment? Like, what was that? When did it happen for you? And, and what was it like? I mean, even now when we just watched uh, some of the scenes, I hadn't seen some of them. Because you play it once, but really, you'll every time you play it I think you'll discover something new and that's that's what it makes so special the reception's been insane you know like I was at a bar in Hollywood and there was this guy who like sheepishly came up and introduced himself and he's like you're a Carl and I was like what are you talking about he's like from immortality huge fan and I was like this is the last thing that I ever expected and he talked for like a half hour about like, you know, he plays with his friends and they're all on headsets and they're all like going through it together and it's this big mystery. And, and then for it to get all the awards and recognition that it's gotten and then go to the BAFTAs, I'm so happy that the creative team, you know, got nominated and was recognized. I didn't even know that that's something we could be nominated for. And we got a casual, a casual email from Sam one morning, wake up and he's like, oh, hey guys, by the way, congratulations on your BAFTA nomination. And I was like, you know what's so funny? I didn't, I, I totally misread it. And I was like, the BAFTA noms are out. And I, I was like, oh cool, Immortality's nominated. That's so amazing. And then I went about my day and it wasn't until later, it was like midnight and I was getting into bed that night. And I started just like going through all of the tags and the stories and everything. And I was like, I'm getting tagged like a lot. Like what's, <laughs> so then I went to the BAFTA website and I was like, wait, am I nominated for right? it? <laughs> yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I know, and that's really cool. That's also what's really, I mean, like going back to us as a team, the fact that the three of us are all together in one category, because that doesn't happen in film. Normally, cinematography is separate, art department separate, costume design is separate. So the fact that the three of us together are nominated oh, for artistic achievement. It made achievement, it so much better. And not only that, but like you look at the other nominees and normally in games, it's like a paragraph long of names that all worked on it, you know, in that category. And then you get to us and it's like Doug, Carey and Stephanie, like us three. So it's, that's also like a huge honor to be recognized among, to me, like some of the greatest artists in the oh world. Oh my gosh. You know, yeah. artistic achievement in a game awards. Are you yeah. kidding me? God like, of War, the Elden art. Ring, Tunic, like... I mean, it was incredible. It was like, it, it, I mean, that's any actor's dream, right? I mean, it, it's and for it to happen in this very strange way that you would never expect was just like kind of an amazing... It just, the whole thing felt like a fever dream. Um, yeah, it was just kind of a wonderful, wonderful time. And then getting to meet developers that I'd been speaking to on Twitter and Instagram and 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 fans of the game and then other actors that who you know we'd kind of been doing the award circuit together Chris Judge Charlotte McBurney like all the you know these people it was so wonderful to get to sort of share it all together and um it's like a career changing you know thing and um and it, it just feels amazing to be a part of a game that I I believe in so much and then to get that recognition that recognition from such a huge you know awards body is amazing and then you know the game awards as well like that was lovely to be be you know like fighting it out with like all these huge triple a games like you feel it it feels like wow we really did something you know 
Uh, it was cool to see you, Manon, at the Game Awards. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, she, you guys seem to see each other. Yeah, every we now see and each again. other a lot. A lot. Uh, yeah. I imagine the work that you do it has a lot of like sort of single serving friends or something, like people you work with for a while and then you never see them again. Um, yeah. Is that typical to, to keep these friendships? No, it's, it's, quite, it's quite rare. Um, and the, the funny thing was like Manon and I, we didn't spend much time together during filming. It was after filming that we we connected over the whole experience and and how similar we were. And so now we hang out. We we do afternoon tea. It's our thing. Um, yes, anyone with suggestions. Uh, so we go and have afternoon tea and we just talk about all the things that we're like we we're both thinking and you know didn't say and and then the process of going forward now which is which is strange very strange like you do such a big part and then um it's still not like a hollywood industry part it's still in the gaming world and it's big there but like to do that switch over it's uh it's still difficult i think it might be different for us just because of that separation um it is is it cinema is it is it game? And it's, you know, it's the hardest thing to describe what this game is. It's three full length features. This is weird, maybe this is just me, but also what I've found is every time I play a part, I, um, it kind of bleeds into my life almost after the, during or after the fact where I feel like it's unlocked a different part of myself or it, um, it almost like life imitates art. It's very weird, the stuff that's happened uh, post immortality that feels very much like it's, it's, oh my God, I've lived this already. And it was in the, in the game and then, and it's very uncanny. So I don't know, there's a weird, like, I don't know, there's a, this about acting that I don't know how to explain, but. There was a lot of weird kind of stories. The, the bar we shot at in the last scene where, um, you know, she falls over on the bar. That was actually the place I bartended for eight years. Warwick, yeah. Place I bartended for eight years. And that was the corner of the bar I worked. Like, it, I could not, and I didn't even know why we were going there until the morning of. I saw the, the address and I was just like, no way. This is crazy. Yeah, so. It must have been a nice personal moment, I guess. It was. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was. It was very, it was very strange, but uh, it was cool. It, because it was like wrapping up the film, too. And yeah, it was a, it was a very cool process. Like a point I made somewhere the other week was a lot of times when you talk about these things, everyone gets very fixated on plot, right? Like, well, how could it work if the scenes are in different orders? Like if you get the ending first, how could that possibly work? And it's like, well, plot is really, I mean, A, it's arbitrary, right? Like you could take Pulp Fiction and, and sell it in a linear order, or you could, you could take Breaking Bad, right? Where they would have the flash forward at the start of the season and then work that way back to it. You could take all of these stories and re-edit them and rearrange them. And, and really what plot is, in the case of say a movie, is you have a human being sat in a dark room in an uncomfortable seat for 90 minutes, not moving, staring straight ahead, pretending all this shit on screen is real. And you don't want them to get distracted. So you've got to keep their eye on the ball. And so the, the plot often, in a movie or a TV show or a book is keeps you engaged because it's constantly, you're thinking about what happens next, what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And that's what stops you from going like, oh, my ass hurts. Like this is, I really, you know, need to hydrate. Um, and the beautiful thing with video games is you, because you are engaged, because we have other things like challenge, exploration, expression, there are other things which keep you engaged in the work. So we can take the, the plot isn't as rigid as important. And so then for me, the story becomes about theme and about character. And so, you know, then th that to me is what's exciting is that the, all these things that you, know, you sit down to write this at the, or start with this in the beginning. And I'm like, I want to think about what I think about movies and stories and acting. Uh, and I go off and do my research and think about it and discuss it with people and, and build it up. Like, I want you to be kind of closer to that moment where we're all kind of, wrestling with this. If I knew the answer, or if, if I could write a sentence that was like, this is the point of this thing, it, the game wouldn't need to exist. 
there's something so beautifully perverse about cinema where you're, you're trying to capture the truth, but you have to do so much fakery to get there, right? And I think that's, I think if this, if there, if there is a side that the game comes on and, and, and the, that catharsis comes from, it is that I do believe we do cap, there is some truth that emerges from it, right? There is something that we capture, uh, whether that is going and watching Breathless and seeing Gene Seberg come alive on the camera and, and have that moment and that's the moment that's persisted not her dying in a car on some random back street in Paris <laughs>